Hi, I'm Caitlin Martin, and in this spotlight, I'm going to share the story of a multi-site, multi-year research and design project to support equity in and through the facilitation of computational tinkering. The project is led by the Creative Communities Research Group at CU Boulder, the Tinkering Studio at the Exploratorium in San Francisco, the Lifelong Kindergarten Group at MIT. I'm lucky enough to help with documentation and formative evaluation of these efforts. The spotlight will focus on the collective partnership moving together over time, sharing some of the organizational advances as well as collective knowledge building and questioning happening across institutions and extended partners. So there's been lots of support and interest in computational thinking, but in this project, the team really wanted to focus on computational tinkering, aiming to broaden the styles of engaging with computing, providing a more social, physical, and cross-disciplinary alternative to more dominant ways of teaching computing that focus on planning and optimization of a single solution. The team also really wanted to focus on the facilitation of computational tinkering, recognizing the important role that facilitators and adult caregivers play in supporting young people to take up these computing opportunities in creative and equitable ways. While this funded project is at the end of its fourth year, the design and practice partnership between the three leadership groups has existed for close to a decade, providing foundations upon which this work is built. The goals for this project were organized into three areas, of design, research, and dissemination. In this spotlight, I'm gonna dig in a little bit to this design project goal of developing and refining computational tinkering activities and tools. So the three distinct groups have diverse perspectives and expertise in research and design for learning and are situated within two research institutions and one museum. Each group also has their own unique longstanding partnership with informal learning organizations and the people who work there. Local project partners include the Idea Lab makerspaces at Denver Public Library and the Computer Clubhouse around the US. And each of those groups and institutions have their own practices, values, and connections to formal and informal organizations and educators and youth and families, as well as policy influencers and funders. This is just to say that this is really a networked constellation of research design and practice organizations and individuals working within those organizations. This expands possibilities for furthering knowledge and developing tools and resources that are relevant and adaptable across spaces and communities. So just a little bit about the timeline that this work is happening in. After that proposal was submitted to NSF in early 2020, COVID hit. And the pandemic really closed the doors to community spaces for learning around the globe. So informal learning organizations and facilitators, of course, were busy finding new ways to connect with youth and families. And for many, any existing plans that they had had went out the window. So most of the first two years of the project was really shifting gears. This included getting to know local facilitation partners, figuring out what might work, inviting opportunities for design and experimentation virtually, and understanding the new challenges and, in, and innovations related to offering services to families and communities. In the third and fourth year, with these strong relationships and deeper understandings, the team members and their local practitioner partners have been able to share and test more widely, continuing to develop resources for facilitating computational tinkering in informal learning spaces. So a little bit about what that process has looked like in the past few years. Recognizing that every setting is different across different dimensions, the teams have co-designed computational tinkering activities and resources with educators and museums and libraries that encourage learners in creative exploration using a combination of physical objects and computational concepts and tools. They've also tried out tools and activities with extended practitioners through conferences and meetups, both virtually and in person. They also aim to provide resources that will support facilitators to adapt activities based on their unique communities and environments and reflect on and push forward their equity-oriented work. So in this R&D process, facilitation, collaboration, research, and development really flow into one another, and educators take on roles of learners, facilitators, and designers. So as part of this research, practice, and design community, the groups regularly find time to reflect on big questions as answers evolve and continue to guide the work. Questions as basic as what exactly is computational tinkering? Also really digging into why is it important? To whom? 
Also, what are the expectations for who takes up the resources in development and how they are being used? And then finally, how do we ensure that the values and contributions of partners and collaborators are integrated and highlighted throughout the process? In terms of computational tinkering, there really still is no one definition. However, there's some emergent ways that people continue to think about computational tinkering and really emphasizing how computational tinkering is multidimensional. Um, constant... But that's what we do. Like we are really good at, I think we are really good at uh, mixing these materials, materiality and this digital. And we created this large cardboard installation where people can, um, a cardboard installation with like lots of windows and we call it tinkering, tinker with a view, so that learners can program or code some kind of scene, what do they see uh, through the, the window. And the cardboard installation is actually, sometimes we design a house or like a living room type of um, environment um, where they can kind of imagine, okay, I see in the living room in this picture frame, this is what I see. So I think it's just important to call out this quality of, um, it's the most natural way of how people learn this in the quality of tinkering. It has a lot of this aspect that you are trying out with the physical materials and you use or deal the coding as just a material or a medium. And I think that's the most, um, meaningful and very nat natural way for people how to learn and that's what something the, the educators in this field tend to forget. So yeah, I really like now calling out computational tinkering even though it's basically about tinkering. I wanted to describe a moment that brought together physical and digital materials in a way that felt meaningful and it's not a computational tinkering moment but it's a moment that has qualities that I hope that we could bring to our computational tinkering work. So the moment that I'm thinking of, we work with a idea lab library maker space called Gonzales and Daria, one of the educators there, she's working on a workshop that she's gonna facilitate this week actually. And it's about bringing together traditional, I think the word is Vivishanka or Vishanka, Ukrainian embroidery and sublimation printing. So that's the digital material and um, t-shirt pressing. So making textiles that have these traditional Ukrainian embroidery motifs on them. So while there's no coding or computing happening, what I really appreciate about it is that she's connecting with a local community. So there's surrounding uh, communities in the area who are Ukrainian immigrants. And this is something that's really special and meaningful to their culture. So she's doing a really, and she's also Ukrainian. So she's bringing in her own heritage and she's trying to um, make sense of her own heritage through facilitating this activity with community members. And the product is beautiful. So it's a very beautiful thing that people are going to be able to take away. The product is meaningful. So she's inviting everybody to encode their own messages, words of affirmation, family names into these designs. So for that to come about, I think that Daria had to think really thoughtfully about what, what represents our culture well or what represents the culture of this community well and how do I communicate that or connect it to the tools and materials that we have available to us in our space and how do you bring people through this whole process of something that's really complex connecting culture technology material fabrication and bringing it all together in one workshop when educators pick up technology sometimes that playfulness and creativity that might be infused in a lot of other areas of their practice suddenly fades away and that instructional approach comes back in where it feels like you have to spend a lot of time and energy on going step by step through how to set up the tool. And it means there's this big barrier before it gets fun and creative and interesting. Um, and I think a lot of the work that we've been focused around has been on how do we get over that barrier? How do we make it so that 
technology is just another tool or material. It's not this special thing that requires a different type of care and attention. And it really becomes just another tool in your toolkit as an educator and as a learner. The biggest thing that I have been thinking about is like distilling down the values that we're hoping to be clear in the activities so that even if you're going to a different space with that looks different, has a different room, has different materials, that you know at least what our values intentions were and, and where they align with your own values and, and intentions and you can start to think about where those merge or where you would need to make tweaks. Um, so I'm thinking about in light play, uh, specifically how we've been thinking about it at Hadley has really been around both like collaborating as a family, being able to have that intergenerational experience and storytelling are the two kind of things that we wanted to push forward. And now I'm thinking about like how can we make more clear what each of those design decisions were um, that we were hoping to accomplish those goals. And then if, if those are aligned with an educator's goals, looking at the activity, how they can think about them, how they might translate that into their space as well, or, or maybe those aren't their goals. Um, and they can think about what their goals would be instead if they took on the activity. Not surprisingly then, the development of resources to support facilitation of computational tinkering in this project go beyond specific activities that educators might take up. They include ideas to anchor computational activities within expansive themes for exploration. They include tools that support flexible creation, integrating digital and physical worlds. And they include ways to center facilitator voices, contexts, and experiences to make the invisible visible and encourage adaptation. First, the idea of exploration spaces. The Exploratorium Museum Tinkering Studio Group coined the phrase exploration space to better describe the exploratory nature of the tinkering approach. This concept that we came up with, which is called an exploration space, it refers to a space physically that is created for learners and for us as educators to work in. So it consists of the materials in front of you, uh, the environment around you, um, examples that inspire you, and that creates an environment for you to and for the learners to design in or develop ideas in. And so that's the physical environment that we consider really important in computational tinkering activities. And it also means a conceptual space that we as educators are aware of. And it's a conceptual space that, for example, can be centered on light and shadow. It's typically a phenomenon that we center that on. And that conceptual space helps us as educators to provide um, engaging ideas for the learners that they can work with without restricting them to certain outcomes. So right? activities, which is the word right, so commonly used in, in, in the field, I see them as entry points often into a larger exploration space. So a number of activities can sit within that space. They are connected through the material and the phenomenon that they all explore. So it's light and shadow and the materials could be a circuit playground express, um, or it could, it could also be the light source on your phone to explore this kind of, um, this kind of phenomenon. Um, and so there, there are these different activities that emerge or are used to enter into an exploration space and they just, uh, they live together in the space. Practices. Areas include light and shadow play, interactive animation, drawing machines, and video sensing. Next, a little bit about the Octo Studio tool and the design process with global partners. Together, we've developed Octo Studio, a new free mobile coding app where children and families can work together to create their own interactive stories, games, animations, anytime, anywhere. Octo Studio brings the opportunity to kids to be creators and not just consumers of technology because they can create their own stories and animations. It's time that they have an app that is developed with an intention 
for children to learn and develop creativity in terms of access uh, we know that uh, like a computer is not available um, in all the villages of india the device that's getting most use is uh, a smartphone so creating a tool that is smartphone based i think is a huge leap from where we were and i think that will really create a lot of opportunity the majority of my youth um they don't have wifi at home they don't have laptops or desktops most of my youth have access to a cell phone that means they also have access to Octo Studio and what that is going to do is spread the love for creating we took a group of students to a hill and we asked them to take pictures of nature and then to start doing their own project the outcome was fantastic we truly believe that going outdoors is the way to go uh, we have the opportunity to travel around brazil to host workshops with students uh, when the young people start to use the octo studio the energy in the classroom became so playful kids were sharing with one another laughing everyone was so excited to use their photos or take pictures of their friends and bring it into their projects i've been commenting about the usage of backdrops that are relatable to people of different cultures because i wanted children to be able to create projects that are meaningful and relatable to them and their neighborhoods and surroundings we translated the english text into Korean. It's really important to have it translated into the Google languages because especially for kids, it makes them feel, feel that they are really invited and welcome to use the tool. We learn so much from educators around the world and we look forward to continuing to learn and collaborate with you as together we expand opportunities for creative learning. And third, a little bit about the equity zines that are under development. The Creative Communities Group at CU Boulder is developing visual prompts and materials to support time and attention to reflection, especially in ways that can help critically embed equity in the process of design and facilitation. During equity sessions, educators work through the workbook, answering questions, reflecting on their own environments, and also engage in discussions with each other. People described how equity success was usually linked to numbers, like how many people were served which didn't really reveal the depth of things asked about here, revealing things that numbers could never convey, such as grace or hope, rebirth, laughter, and empowerment. One person said, when it was like, describe how equity feels and sounds like, I don't think I ever would have thought to ask that question. So it's like my perception changed a little bit. A lot of people talked about appreciating the physical nature of the zine and took it back to their own workplaces. Inspired by this, the team has been developing additional equity zines as well as a facilitator guide to help people take this back to their own workplaces and have their own equity conversations. While these resources to support facilitation of computational tinkering are emergent and diverse, they are anchored by design themes resonating across the multi-organization design and research effort. First is framing that emphasizes attention to values and equity instead of learning goals. Second is the idea of attending to a temporal dimension that supports reflection and organic use of computing beyond a prescribed activity. And third, recognition of informal learning educators as experienced designers. Importantly, not designing materials for educators to enact with their learners, such as a listicle of best practices or a typical activity guide layout, but instead supporting adaptation through reflection and annotation to prioritize facilitator voice in the why and the how. So I bring back these persistent, emergent, and iterative questions because they, they are still ongoing. There are still no set in stone answers. And I add this fifth one as this project, the funding for it draws to a close um, in recognizing how much the pandemic shaped what we had time to do in the first couple of years um, asking this question of how to ensure that there is continued time for building relationships and compensation for the deep work with partners and informal learning organizations that is necessary. You know, how can we encourage funding organizations and fund and project timelines to pay attention to these really, really important fundamental pieces? Thank you, and we look forward to talking more at the meetup. You can also learn more about the project and connect with other members of the team at other CLS meetups and workshops. You can also sign up for the project newsletter 
called Tinkering Together to receive more updates and access to resources.